Our scripture text this week comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost came, Jesus' disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Some, however, made fun of the disciples and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I said. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. So our text today picks up right where our story from last week left off. Last week we read the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven from the Gospel of Luke. And the very last thing he said before he ascended was this. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So now, in our verses this week, we see that exact thing happen. As Regina said earlier, and as we have been celebrating, it is on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish holiday when people from all over traveled to Jerusalem and gave thanks to God for the blessing of a good harvest. So now we, as Christians, celebrate it because it is the birthday of the church. The day Christianity changed from a small group of Jesus followers into a great, big, multicultural movement. The first Easter when Jesus rose from the dead was on the Jewish holiday of Passover. Pentecost was always 50 days after Passover, so that's why we celebrate Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, and it's time to celebrate the church's birthday. In Acts chapter 1, it says that there were only about 120 Jesus followers at the time when the day began. And they were all huddled together in the upper room where they had been staying ever since they arrived in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. In the past, their lives were defined by wherever Jesus went. But starting now, their lives will be defined by wherever God's Holy Spirit will take them. It all starts here on Pentecost. That's why the birthday of the church is important. Birthdays are celebrations of life. Celebrations of what God's Spirit has done through you in the past and a celebration of where the Holy Spirit will take you in the future. Reminds me of that great hymn line, "'Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." But you need to hang on, because the way grace will lead you home, under the pull of the Holy Spirit, might be kind of a wild ride, with some rushing wind involved. It might lead you out into awkward situations where you're called on to speak from your heart, maybe to someone even that you don't know, like in our text today. Or it might be extra weird these days 
when the Spirit calls you to speak because you and the other person might both be wearing masks. So you have to shout loud in order to be heard while your glasses fog up in embarrassment. Or it might be awkward when the Holy Spirit invites you to speak to someone who might not be very likable. That might be the most difficult situation you're called to. You might even prefer to learn a whole new other language instead of talking with someone that you'd rather avoid. Maybe because they're so different, or if they're disrespectful or insensitive. You may feel insecure about talking with people you don't know or have much in common with. But remember, after receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the apostles were able to talk with everyone, no matter what their differences were. So remember that that holy power is available to you to make connections. That's what Pentecost is about, making connections with other people who are different or who are from somewhere else. We need to hear that story today. For the past few decades, our country has continued to get more and more disconnected. So now it seems the divisions are worse than ever, and we are more polarized than we ever were. We need connections. Since people from the very top of society all the way to the bottom try to increase division by encouraging mistrust and rudeness, by refusing to work together and cooperate and compromise. Instead of trying to build us up, now it's more commonplace to hear insults meant to tear others down. Or temper tantrums when people don't get their way. But that is the way of worldliness and immaturity and greed. We are called to a higher way the way of Christ Jesus. The story of Pentecost reminds us that we are given the gifts and the mission to overcome any division and to bring people together. Now, if you're thinking that you don't have what it takes to bring our whole country back together again, I've got two pieces of good news for you. The first one is that you're right, you don't, but God will give you the power that you need to do whatever God calls you to do. And second, you don't even have to worry about that anyway. You're not called to fix everyone and to make all the problems go away. That's God's plan and that's God's work. You are just called to be who you are, where you are, and to honor God with your life. That's it. Anyone can do that. Think of it this way. That big day of Pentecost was awesome, amazing, miraculous, incredible. By the end of that chapter, Acts chapter 2, it says that 3,000 more people had given their lives to God just that day. What a big, huge, amazing day. Now think about the people who were already Jesus followers when the day began. Only 120 of them, less than that, probably squeezed into that upper room, praying to God for guidance about what to do. And most of their names, we don't know. So let's give two of them some names so we can think about what their day might have been like. Let's name them Micah and Susanna, good biblical names. So the whole big, huge day of Pentecost is not all on their shoulders. It is not all up to them. Micah and Susanna don't have to worry about everything and making sure Pentecost is a success. It'd be bad if they did, because they're just good, regular people. So all Micah and Susanna have to do is have a conversation with somebody who's outside. That's it. The verses don't say that everyone could speak in every language. No, but each person was gifted with the words 
and the courage that they needed to have a conversation with one person. And maybe they were so excited that day that they talked with a lot of other people too who spoke that language. So don't worry. There was no pressure on them on the day of Pentecost. There's no pressure on you because it's not all up to you. You're just called to be who you are, where you are, to honor God with your life, and to have conversations. That is our Pentecost calling. We so often pray that God would fill us up with the Holy Spirit, but be careful what you pray for. When the Holy Spirit filled up Jesus' followers in Acts chapter 2, crazy things happened. On the spot, they could communicate with the folks outside from different countries. I bet they didn't see that coming when they woke up that morning and gathered for prayer in the upper room. Who knew that simply gathering for prayer and worship could take you outside doing crazy, unexpected things? It reminds me of a story I heard from a Christian pastor who serves a church in the actual land of Galilee. Definitely a holy place to live and to work and to minister. His name is Elias Shakur. He was born there in Galilee, in Palestine. Later in life, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times. But when he was a boy in 1948, the Israelis moved into Palestine, moved into Galilee, moved into his village, and forced everyone out. So he became a refugee when he was only eight years old. But instead of being overcome with anger at the Israelis for cruelly forcing people out of their homes, Elias Shakur entered the ministry to help his fellow Palestinians survive as best they could under Israeli occupation. So he became a pastor of a Christian church there in Galilee, near to where their homes were before they were pushed out. Understandably, the people in his church had difficult lives, so they were understandably bitter, having to live as refugees down the road from their own homes. So in Pastor Shakur's church, emotions were tense and anger was high. It was a hard place to minister. He had only been the pastor for six months when Palm Sunday rolled around, the Sunday before Easter, and the church was full for that special day, and people were holding palm branches like we do on Palm Sunday. And Pastor Shakur began his worship service by saying, peace be with you, but he could tell that there was no peace in his congregation. Instead, he said they were all in pieces. They were broken. They were fragmented. The sadness and stress they had experienced gave rise to different groups in the church dividing into angry factions. And by the end of that Palm Sunday worship service, he couldn't take it anymore. So he said, I tried my best to reconcile you, and I failed. Today, there is only one person who is able to reconcile you together. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's here with us in this church. Hold on a second. And at that point, even though Pastor Shakur hadn't planned any of this ahead of time, on the spot, he walked to the back of the church where the door was, and he locked it. It was an old door with an old lock and a big iron old key that went ka-chunk for everyone to hear as he locked it and put it back in his pocket. Then he walked back to the front to the altar table and said, the door is closed. You can't get out. You have to decide either to come together now and Jesus will be your Lord and I will be your pastor or you can fight it out and kill each other right here and I will preach your funeral. Decide whatever you want. I'm waiting. And he stood there. 
Isn't that wild? Isn't that amazing? Pastor Shakur said it was the craziest thing that he had done in his life, and it was all on the spur of the moment. You might say by the Holy Spirit's leading. Well, he stood there, and he waited for a few minutes that he said felt like forever. When a man stood up, the man had been convicted, and he said, Pastor, I feel God's presence here. I will stop being divisive now. I forgive everyone, and I ask everyone to forgive me. Pastor Shakur said, my brother, come here, and they hugged each other. Then Pastor Shakur invited everyone to repent and to confess and to join together and to have what he called a celebration of hugging. So the church all hugged each other in the congregation for 45 minutes straight with smiles and tears. Isn't that incredible? Especially to think about that now, these days. Wouldn't it be amazing to just hug good folks for 45 minutes? Maybe we'll plan that for when we can hug other good folks again. Well, Pastor Shakur said that they were all so full of the Holy Spirit and, and with joy that they decided to go immediately outside of their church and walk to everywhere in the village that people lived to celebrate the resurrection, the joy, and the peace of Christ. What an amazing story that is. Just think of all the joy and the good news that was shared with people in that community that day through tears and smiles and laughter. That's a good Pentecost story right there. So yes, be careful what you pray for. Do you pray that God would fill you up with the Holy Spirit? Then get ready for some amazing things to happen, like it did on Pentecost. Pentecost is a story about how the Christian church realized its true mission and potential when it stopped meeting inside and got more connected with people on the outside. That makes me think. I can't help but think about our situation today. Hmm. What if we had two of the Christians that we made up names for today, maybe those two good, regular Christian folks whose names we made up, let's say Micah and Susanna, who were there on that first Pentecost, what if they were here today and we could talk to them and ask them about that day and share what was on our hearts? And we told them how hard things are for us these days. And we said, oh, it's just so terrible. We shouldn't even gather inside for church right now because it's not safe. I think if they heard that, they would say, so what? That's not bad. Have you heard about what happened to us when we got out of the church and into our community? It was miraculous. We might say, well, yeah, but it's harder now to talk with people outside because of the, the social distance thing and the crowd size and the mask and everything. It's just too hard. And I wonder if they might say, well, you can still speak the same language, right? We couldn't even do that, but the Holy Spirit gave us what we needed, and it'll do the same for you. Hmm. That can be hard to believe and accept sometimes, but it's true. The church's real power doesn't come from buildings and who is in them. The church's real power comes from the Holy Spirit. The church's true mission is to share God's good news. And the church's true place is out in the world. Maybe we have been offered a Pentecost opportunity today. May we be ready to take it. Let's pray. Well, God, we so often pray to you and invite 
your Holy Spirit to move among us and fill us up. But I think we might need to confess that we wouldn't be ready if it did. So we will need not just your Spirit's power, but your courage as well. We will need to have hearts that are ready to go out into strange places, even to talk to strange people. So God, we do ask you to break us today and to mold us into the Christian army that you want to send out and spread your peace and your good news today in such a strange world with so many challenges. May we never stop. May we never worry about those challenges because we remember that your Holy Spirit can overcome any setback, any difference, any virus, any quarantine, and that your spirit is greater than anything in the world. May we allow you to fill us up today. Amen.